other day. Yeah. And I've been, you know, many times in the past. And I'm going to start on an ignorant note because what I didn't realize is that so many of the uh, paintings and other works in the museum that, that I thought you must have bought, in 1970 you bought this historical piece of work, were actually pieces that the museum acquired back when they were contemporary pieces of art. I'm talking about Impressionism and so forth. Absolutely. Um, we have an encyclopedic collection, so it goes way back in time across the globe, many cultures. But the one thing about Chicago is that it's always been, was, and is involved in what's happening now. And so when we opened the museum on Michigan Avenue, that you visited the other day. Um, with the lions outside? With the lions yeah. outside. <laughs> Uh, at that time, people were buying Monet and Renoir and the Impressionists, and it was like buying Warhol today. I mean, in fact, these people, Warhol's dead, these people were still painting. So they were buying, you know, we have pictures in the museum that were bought when the paint was still wet when they were shown in Paris for the first time in 1891 by someone like Monet. So this was really art of the moment, and then the century changes, and they keep on doing this. And the thing that makes Chicago different from, let's say, the Met, is that most of the American museums were buying modern art in the late 19th century. So you've got a lot of impressionism across the, across the country at museums. But then in the 20th century, when all of a sudden the notion of modernity creeps in, art becomes abstract, it's more difficult to people, for people to read, they feel more challenged, a lot of the big institutions start backing off. Hmm. And Chicago didn't, uh, because the collectors, the City of Modern Architecture, they kept collecting. They collected Picasso and Matisse and all those people. And New York, for example, stopped. So that sometimes the Museum of Modern Art is called the biggest mistake the Metropolitan Museum ever made. In <laughs> other words, in other words uh, they stopped, and there was a perceived need. People were collecting. They had to find another outlet. But that never happened at the Art Institute, so it's one of the few. It, it's distinguished of all encyclopedic museums in the world because you can go from classical times and before up to art of the present. So that's that's the DNA of Chicago and the Art Institute. So, to your point, if you were, if I go to a museum yeah. and I see, and this is I would imagine true for many people, right? And I go see uh, a Monet exhibit or I see Impressionism. I might not understand everything about its historical roots. I might understand the story. I might not understand the meaning. But chances are I will really enjoy the experience, really enjoy looking at it. Right. On the other hand, for many people, if they go see a piece of contemporary art, they might feel bewildered. They might say, I don't. Some people might love it, but other people might say, at the worst, that's not art. So my question is, back when the museum was first acquiring Impressionist works, was that the way people felt about those works, or was the culture different and people immediately no, gravitated the towards the them? the culture was the same. I mean, history repeats itself, and what was happening when the Impressionists were painting, the, qui the big criticism was, these people don't bother finishing their work. These are sketches, <laughs> these, are things, these are things that you do in preparation for making a finished picture. These are not finished pictures. So what they basically said was, it's no good because it's not, there's not enough craft in the picture. Also, it was, how can you make art so quickly? Because people knew that Monet went out and put the landscape in nature and painted a picture, and there wasn't, an, in a way, enough craft inven investment for people to feel comfortable. I mean, but when art goes from representational to abstraction, that's when it becomes still more difficult. Right? So you have an exhibition now, Christopher Wool, who is a... Uh, grew up in Chicago, I believe, and right. is, lives in New York now. But in several articles about his work, and I think also on, on the website itself, at the Art Institute website, there's talk about how he was either dealing with or responding to the end of painting. And I read something like that, and I'm like, what? What do you mean? Painting's over? Right, right, like, right, 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 right. What, what does that mean? Uh, that has a meaning for people who follow the history of painting. In other words, it was So not after, for me. Uh, but not for you, <laughs> but not for you. But, I mean, the point is, the po I think the point, the real point is that sometimes when people are confronted with a work of art in a museum, they think they have to know all about it, when they don't. I mean, they can just look at it and take what they take from it. If there's nothing, if they find nothing in it, well, then that's a bit of a problem. 
But if they look at it and enjoy something about it, that's a beginning. I mean, it's interesting in the culture that people can listen to music, maybe not get it, but not feel perhaps as threatened sure. by the fact that they don't get it. Uh, I guess it's because music is part of the culture. And maybe for people that went to museums when they were kids, it all seems more familiar. But I think sometimes people just don't know what they're supposed to do in a museum. I mean, I, I took a course at business school soon, soon after becoming director, and one of the people in one of my courses, a guy, successful, early 40s, family, they go to, they go to the Shed, history museums, etc. He said, I've never been in an art museum in my life. My parents never brought me, and so I don't know what I would do. So tell me what I would do. I would come in, I'd be with my children, would go and would stand up in front of a picture, and then what would happen? <laughs> in other words, in other words, there was an expectation that he would have to, rather than just, you look at it, if you like it, you stand and look some more. If you don't, you look at the next picture. But there's a sense of inadequacy that well, people feel yeah. sometimes with the visual arts that they don't feel when they see a movie or they see or they hear, listen to music. They think, I like it, that's good. I don't like it, that's not good. Uh, but if I like it, maybe I'll listen more. Maybe I'll see more films by this director. So it's the same thing in an art museum, but because it is in like our building behind the lines, an August institution, people are nervous about protocols. Will I embarrass myself looking at a work of art? What should I be doing when I look at a work of well, art? Well, I mean, I, I don't know what it's like to be a 40-year-old with children, but uh, <laughs> in this man's defense, yes. There's usually a, a write-up, and you read it, and I agree with you. On the one hand, I should be able to just look at a piece and say, this makes me feel a certain way, or, or, or I'm reacting a certain way to this. Sure. But the write-up often can do two things. It can either make you more appreciative, or it can make you feel ignorant because you don't understand. That's true. That's true. And that's all museums are wrestling with that. We just did a, a research project. We've got in specialists over a year to analyze how we're doing with our audience or audiences. So we find that we're doing great with the audience that knows how to negotiate a museum and sort of they're sort of museum literate. We have to do better in terms of engaging people that have not had quite that experience. I mean, we're doing things now with apps on iPhones, etc. So you'll be able to, if you don't want to read the label, you could take just your play Angry kids. Birds while you're yeah, in exactly. There. <laughs> well, no, no, but you can you can take the monkey tour. Yeah. So you can find the monkeys in the pictures, and that's not so very difficult. But the, but it's a way in. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not talking about me. I, I I I can handle the museum. I don't know. I don't know about the crowd here, but. Um, it, Looking at an exhibition like Christopher Wolfe, right. and this might be such a basic question, but is all art that is made by necessity a reaction or a comment to art that has gone before? In other words, could, what if I showed up and I just had excellent skills and painted the most beautiful impressionist work? Would it matter at all? Not really. <laughs> and I understand no, that. No, but, the reason but why? it wouldn't matter is because art has to be of its own time, right? So the Impressionists were painting over 100 years ago. And unless has it been that long? It's no. been that long. <laughs> it's been that long. But I mean, the best of, of art, like the best of uh, literature, music, et cetera, et cetera, you have people making art in the present but are aware of a tradition. Now, whether that, whether that becomes manifest in the work of art, whether you can look at something and say, oh, yeah he looked at or she looked at so-and-so, or whether it just sort of in, it inspired the artist or helped craft the way he thought, there is a dialogue between present and past. But it's not a dialogue that you, as the viewer, have to be so acutely aware of. I mean, you should just look at the work of art and see what you get from it. If it intrigues you enough to want to, to, want to find more, then that's fine. I mean, that's like anything else. I mean, yeah. you know a bit about something and maybe want to know more about something. I mean, you have to, to a degree, I think you have to also trust your gut. It's just a question of whether you go into a museum in a defensive posture, like prove it to me, or leave, <laughs> it, or leave yourself open to just seeing what, what engages you. Talk about the joy of being a curator, and you mentioned trying to find out more, and that's obviously what 
a large part of what I imagine a curator does, digging deep into either a genre or a particular artist or understanding things or finding out things that has, have not been thought of before. Oh, that's always fun. I mean, detective work is always fun. But I mean, the reason I got into it was, well, it, it, was, it was not really that direct, but from early on, I had a few experiences that in front of works of art, not that I was li studying art or looking, but that really were eureka experiences. And so having had that happen, I think the first one was I was a teenager, I was about 14, 15. There was a Van Gogh uh, exhibition in Montreal. I had heard of Van Gogh, I had heard about the year. So I went to see the show. I don't remember very much about the show as a whole, but now when I look back at the catalog, there were some very important pictures there, but I didn't stop in front of them, but there was one picture. And that was a picture of a flowering fruit tree in spring, Van Gogh was in Arles, in the south of France. And I stood in front of it, and I guess until that moment I had thought the aim of art was to basically, in paint, photograph the world around us. And that was the, that was the benchmark, how, the degree of representation. So with this painting, it was that I recognized it was a painting of spring, but I felt something that I had never felt before in front of a work of art, which is that it felt like spring. It almost smelt like spring. I mean, you felt the, you felt the sap rising. It was just that sense of expectation and change and joy. And with Van Gogh, with that, with that sort of brush stroke, with that heavy painted brush stroke, you sort of got a sense of things growing and moving. And it was extraordinary. Wow. But then I didn't say I want to go into art history yeah. because I didn't know there was a, such a thing as art history. I thought that's a nice thing to do when it happens to you. And so that happened a few more times, but when I, I sort of backed into art history because I thought I'll finally have to figure out what to do when it comes to choosing a profession. So I took undergraduate work and then I thought I'll be a doc, I wanted to be a doctor, a psychiatrist in fact. But then I thought, <laughs> too long, I'll be 30, which yeah. seemed ancient yeah. when I graduated. <laughs> no, yeah. no. So then I thought, okay, face up to it, because I did English and philosophy. In other words, I was just having fun reading and doing such. Sure. So I said, I'll, be, I'll go into law. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So we've got medicine, English, philosophy, law. No, English philosophy was just learning to think at, sure. at college. Yeah. Then leading to medicine. But then okay. I backed off medicine because there was blood before the mind. So you were a confused young man. <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. No. But so anyway, so I, I know I didn't do law. Then I went in to do, I did a master's in English for a year because that could give me a year more reading. So okay. That was yeah. Fun. Yeah. Uh, but then I went to. Who are your parents? Very understanding people. <laughs> very understanding people. And so then I went to business school for three weeks. And, uh, <laughs> Three months. I gotta write this stuff down. <laughs> no, but then I decided because I had loved doing understanding more works of art, understanding the type of research. You know, you always someone wants to always discover something new, particularly if it's something involved with a famous work of art, a famous piece of music. If you find out more about the Mona Lisa, it changes the way you think about the picture. So that's sort of detective work. Yeah. The fact that that could be, I could do that kind of research, but then also engage in the so-called real world of business and the art market, that gave me, that I thought was sort of a confluence of two types of directions that I wanted to follow. So I started taking courses in art history and then because I went to places where there were museums, uh, Oberlin, Yale, um, I became very interested in museums. But the thing is my, my, aside from the personal satisfaction that you get finding out something new, new information about Gauguin, Vincent and Arles, Vincent van Gogh, which was a great, great project. It's also trying to do I things felt bad that for Van Gogh in that situation. Mm -hmm. In that situation that you're talking about, Van Gogh seemed to get the short end of the stick. Yeah, but the thing is, he would have got the short end of the stick no matter what. In other words, Gauguin could not take care of, of his meta of his his the problems that he was facing. He was bipolar. Uh, it was difficult for Gauguin to deal with it. His brother, whom he loved dearly, had sent him to the south of France because he couldn't deal with it either. Yeah. So it was not going to turn out that The year well. was going to go no matter what. The year or what, some it's other too soon? Somebody's like <laughs> growing about that. 
<laughs> but with something like that, I, I think that it's not only because so it's the story, but the thing is finally you wanna, I wanna get people in the position that they're looking at a picture in an exhibition and feel what I felt in front of a picture in an exhibition uh, when I was 14. When, I mean, you see so much art. Yeah. When was the last time that you felt that same feeling that you had when you were 14 about a particular piece? About a particular piece happens rarely about a group of work, about a group of work. I mean, it, it, uh, this is not promotional. No, no. Christopher Wool, I think, is a wonderful artist. I was interested in the word paintings. I didn't know the abstractions as well. So I went to the show at the Guggenheim, and I went once, and I thought more interesting than I had really thought it was going to be. When a second time became more deeply engaged, now in Chicago, it's a different show because when you install a show differently, you create different conversations, there are different things, different dialogues that happen and that you can witness. Uh, so now for me, the Christopher Wool show is a deeply beautiful show in a way that I would not have imagined four months ago. And you're talking about with the abstract works, those the abstract big works. ones that it seems like he's scraping away and then adding new he's layers do, he's on. He's doing all sorts of strange things. I mean, getting back to your question about the death of painting. In other words, after abstract expressionism and the heroic gestures of a Jackson Pollock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, people said, okay, what comes next? Is painting played out? Is there a next act for painting? They've been saying this for a long time, but Christopher Wool is seen as the guy that actually addresses that sort of gestural painting and actually gets gesture on canvas, which is not gesture. In other words, a lot of these surfaces are made by photography and silkscreen, or they're made with spray paint, or they're made, in other words, it's not the brush, it's not Jackson Pollock. It is part of that lineage, but it's redoing it in a totally new way, which is probably more immediately accessible to outsiders, but sometimes you don't have to know so much how something is made just to stand in front of it and think, this is pretty wonderful. I don't know why I like it, but I like it. I think, th I mean, that's, ex you, that's exactly the way I felt during that ex exhibition. Didn't understand everything I was told. I was with a very kind tour guide, yeah. but, but was able to, to just appreciate it for, for what it was in front of me. Right, and so the, there were some people that that's the way they start, and like anything that people are interested in, like people interested in people, then they get to know the object of their interest better, and that's the way people become collectors. That's the way people become museum goers. That's the way people become deeply involved with art. Do you ever, I mean, most of us, we go to the museum and it's on a Saturday or, and, and there's a lot of people there. You have the luxury of, of being there for your work. Do you ever, when it's closed, just walk around by yourself? That's my favorite time, particularly in the morning, because those are the hours when my eyes are, or anyone's eyes, or I would think, are the freshest. So to go in those galleries before the artificial lights come up with just natural light and see those pictures. And you know, with a great work of art, a great work of art never fully explains itself. So you can look at it again and again and again, but you never sort of get it. You get parts of it, you get bits of it, but if it's truly great, it keeps you engaged because it will never give up all of itself. And we have a lot of those works of art and that's what makes being in the museum particularly when the museum is mine alone, if I'm in the gallery alone, absolutely thrilling. Yeah, it's beautiful. Douglas, thank you so much for being here.